Today's episode is sponsored by the American Homebrewers Association. Become a part of the U.S.'s largest community of homebrewers for just $48 a year by going to unitedwedrink.com slash AHA. What exactly do you get with your AHA membership? How about a year-long subscription to Zymergy Magazine, the world's longest-running homebrew magazine? Exclusive deals and discounts at over 2,000 breweries, bars, and bottle shops across America. Discounts on brewers' publication books and merchandise. Access to a huge library of previous homebrew con seminars and talks. And early access to purchasing tickets to each year's Great American Beer Festival and Savor. Sign up now by going to unitedwedrink.com slash AHA and get a year's membership for just $48. And if you sign up now, you'll get a free gift. What's that gift? I'm not saying. You need to go see for yourself. It's pretty great. Support United We Drink, support homebrewing, and support the American Homebrewers Association at unitedwedrink.com slash AHA. The opinions and statements in this podcast do not represent those of the hosts, employers, co-workers, family, or imaginary friends. Now enjoy the show. Happy hour, more like amateur hour. Welcome to United We Drink. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast that I didn't write an intro for this week. Welcome to United We Drink, right here on unitedwedrink.com, as well as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and wherever fine podcasts are found. My name is Mike Yurevich, and I'm a very tired new owner of a puppy, and I am joined by my two co-hosts of the show. First up is a man who right now is probably having nightmares about ABPs. This is Phil Palmasano. Hey guys, yeah, I totally am, and uh, I'm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's <almost laughs> ready for over. it to be over. It's, it's almost, almost over. It's almost over. Also with us is a man who may someday just up and leave Florida for the hills of North Carolina. Here's Joel Codner. Uh, not far enough, but thanks, Mike. <laughs> well, I'll go to North Carolina then. Sure, I'll take his place. Uh, thank you, everyone, who has continued listening to the show and listened to last week's mini episode as well as the last main episode where we talked about ip theft and design in the beer industry a really fun episode i think um phil even admitted that he didn't think that that was going to be as fun of a show as it turned out to be right yeah yeah and i'm hoping for the same tonight (laughs) um what are we drinking gentlemen before we get into stuff (laughs) I'll go first. Uh, I am drinking a dragon fruit passion fruit kombucha from Counterculture out of Miami. Someone dropped a growler of it off to the brewery. Uh, I don't know who. I, I have to reach out to them and say thank you. Really good stuff. Not to be confused with Counterculture Coffee, who are opening up a shop in Miami and do not make kombucha. I am drinking a Cigar City Guayabera Citra Pale Ale. Um, I I also have a a chaser of uh, apple brandy. I, this evening, am partaking in three non-alcoholic beverages throughout our entire recording. I have a surreal Kolsch that I'm enjoying right now, which actually isn't too bad. I have Partake Brewing IPA and Athletic Brewing Company IPA as well. So was able to find these fine non-alcoholic beverages in my travels this week and figured, well, what better time to uh, to share these uh, socially with everyone and sort of give my spins on them. Really sticking to this week's theme of safety. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, and the seltzers that I drank all day. But yes, you're right. I have my safety goggles on. <laughs> uh phil why don't you take us into the news for today awesome sounds good so um miller coors hot off their successful ad campaign for coors light 
talked about it a few episodes ago called Made to Chill, uh, are now refocusing on Miller Lite with a new idea, which the ad campaign is called A Few Friends Are Better Than A Few Thousand Followers, calling out that having a beer with friends is the original social media. My question to you guys is, will this work in a society that is so focused on likes and crazed with social media? I, I would like to believe it can work to a certain standpoint. It's probably not going to reach a huge uh, market out there. But I know that there are people out there who, who want to just go out and, and converse and talk and kind of be like the olden days. Uh, a lot of breweries out there don't have TVs because they want people to be able to socialize inside of their tap rooms and tasting rooms. And I, I think that that's an admirable thing. Um, I ha- I've thought of like ideas for a non-existent brewery in my own head about doing things that are like social media blackout nights where no one's allowed to use a phone uh, and things like that. Uh, but I... Uh, I give them credit for for really trying and pushing for something like this, but it it's it's going to be tough. As much as I want it to be a successful thing, I don't think it's going to work. But I love how well intentioned it is. I I don't think it matters what you're drinking. People are still going to be glued to their phones. I'm so tempted right now to put like a giant sign on the back of my car that just says "Get off your fucking phone" because. Just driving down 95, like everyone's on their phones. I can't believe more people aren't aren't killing each other, uh, texting and driving and all that. But I, I I I like the campaign. I think it's coming from a really good place. Yeah. I don't know if it's going to work or not. And and I it's social media blackouts and stuff like that. And when when you get into that, now we're talking tool concerts and uh, new comedy, uh, stand up comedy bits. I I really believe. Miller Coors is trying to connect to the millennial group, but at the same time, I uh, that kind of alienates I, or alienates uh, the uh, millennials. Yeah, exactly. The 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 the, the, the group that they're trying to connect to is the group that is actually probably the worst when it comes to being connected to actual an actual device. So, I'll be very curious to see how they actually execute this and and move forward with that. Social networks are purposely designed now to keep you addicted, keep you clicking, keep you scrolling. And there is a legitimate, real dopamine rush that you get every time you get a like, a retweet. People are, like, realistically addicted to these things. And I think it would be cool if you had some sort of campaign where you go to these locations and you say, hey, if you want a Miller Lite, you know, like if the if the brewery or their representatives were going to these bars and setting up events where it's like, if you want one of these, turn in your phone and we'll give it back to you when you close out your tab and keep people socially engaged with each other. But I mean, it's funny, like sometimes we're engaged with each other on our phones sitting right next to each other. I mean, like I've... I've been sitting next to Mike and we're like liking each other's tweets and you know talking to each other through like three I I was g- going to text him from across the bar the other day just to say something I couldn't say in front of a couple other people. Yeah, this is going to be a tough one for them. I, it's better than the Jonas Brothers, I can tell you that. I do believe that when you look at it People are, first of all, people are making money off of their likes, right? So not only is it a dopamine rush, but it's actually, uh, I I met somebody this past weekend that said, oh, I'm a social media influencer. And it's like, really? That's a job at this point in stage? And they're like, oh, yeah, this is how much money I made in the past month. And it's baffling to me that social media drives that much. And And I think the one thing that I'm really the most curious about this ad campaign in particular is how they execute this outside of social media, because you can't advertise it on social media saying, get off social media and drink with your friends. Yeah, Just, it's <laughs> it's hypocritical. Absolutely. Next piece of news, a little bit less uh, uh, argumentative, I guess. Taco Bell cantinas are continuing to pop up around the United States. In fact, we just got our first one in downtown Fort Lauderdale. These locations have beer, wine, slushy cocktails, and more. Outside of the slushy cocktails, Joel. (laughs) (laughs) Is this uh, a new area for beverage to focus on, meaning fast food, or is this just a fast fad? 
no, I think this is the first step in in something where I hope this leads towards Demolition Man, where Taco Bell wins the franchise wars and it's the only restaurant in town. Um, I think it's great. Uh, I definitely want to check out this location. I didn't know there was one that close. I think we should all go. I, I'm for it if uh, everyone wants to take a field trip at some point. We we brought this up very briefly, I think, uh, a couple main episodes ago when we were talking about the um, uh, White Castle Weyerbacher uh, collaboration. I think Joel mentioned this specifically with, a, I think, a Blue Point uh, collaboration that they've done with the Taco Bell Cantinas. Um, look... Taco Bell is still always going to be that weird, crazy, addictive thing that even though I haven't had in a very long time, I now live close to one again and it like stares at me and I feel like it talks to me. And it's like, hey, <laughs> you haven't come come by here in a long time. We've really missed you. And twice this past weekend, my fiance jokingly said we should go to Taco Bell after like being out at night. And I'm like. She's joking, but she's also probably like kind of serious at the same time. Like, let's just do it. Um, I, I'm all for checking it out. Uh, I've heard good things about some of the places. And if it's typical Taco Bell food with some extra bells and whistles and plus I can have a drink or two, why not? Why not give it a whirl? I really believe that this is where we're going in the beverage community. So think really? about it. Uh, yeah, well, think about it. So everybody's on this kick and craze of better for you, uh, eating better, uh, eating keto, drinking less calories, less carbs. How are fast food restaurants going to differentiate themselves or actually compete with some of these other restaurants? Well, Okay, they can offer salads or things of that nature, or they can turn around and they can offer alcohol and they can say, hey, we're going to be open till four o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning and it's going to be a club Taco Bell. I think this is a way for Taco Bell to turn around and I think a handful of other fast food chains have actually dipped into this. I think it's a way for them to compete against some of these other uh, chain restaurants similar to a Buffalo Wild Wings or a Chili's or a Bennigan's or a TGI Friday's. And I think that it's just reality that they are looking for more options for their consumer and trying to get the consumer to stay a little bit longer. So I'll, I'm curious to see where it goes. I don't know if there's technically a sponsorship opportunity here with Taco Bell. Maybe Modelo or Corona wants to jump in on that one. But outside of that, um, you know, I I'll be happy to have a margarita goza and uh, and Taco Bell with a Crunchwrap Supreme, and even more, I will be happy to go there with you guys and meet you up. <laughs> the funny part of it to me is that by the time I'm in you know in line for Taco Bell, I've probably already had enough to drink. <laughs> Probably, but they got slushies, and we know you love slushies. <laughs> Joel's a convert. Final piece of news this week. Yingling announced this past week that they are going to open a new facility in Tampa, Florida. Um, it, it, I'm sure everyone knows that their second location outside of Pottsville is in Tampa. Third. Um, included in this new facility is a 200-room hotel a restaurant, a microbrewery, a beer garden, meeting space, and of course a gift shop, all on a new 43-acre plot of land. We've seen a handful of these already pop up with PBR owning a hotel chain as well or a hotel location and BrewDog owning a hotel location. My question to you guys, Joel, would you do a family vacation at one of these resorts or are they just for the brocations? I don't think it's really either or. I wouldn't go for a family vacation there. I I, I can't I, I don't see how it's going to be as kid friendly as like, you know, uh an embassy suites in Orlando or something like that. Maybe it will be. Maybe they'll have all kinds of, you know, shit for kids, but I just don't see myself staying at the Yingling Hotel or flying brew dog airlines. Every time I see one of these things, I'm just like, whatever. Um I understand the diversification and needing to branch out and keep things interesting. It doesn't interest me all that much. I would much rather, you know, when I'm in Tampa, go check out the Yingling Hotel and, and restaurant, maybe dine there, take a tour. 
but I, I just don't see myself staying at one of these places. And I certainly don't feel like I would ever try to tell another brewery what to do with their business, but I just feel like I would much rather see a giant brewery open like a local brewing school or something than a gimmicky hotel. Uh, I, I I get what you mean there, but they probably won't make as much money uh, off of just having a brewing school as opposed to something like this that uh, that caters to more people, a larger demographic than just people who are interested in learning how to brew. But I, I get what you mean there. And wait, but, you're telling me you're telling me beer is a business? Uh, so I've been told, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this this tends to like I I find this to be an interesting one to me personally. I don't think it's a family vacation thing. I I don't even know about Bro Weekend Getaway because out by where the Yingling Brewery is in Tampa, there's not really a whole lot going on out there. There there's USF is close by, right? The Correct, and university. the new Yingling Sundome, uh, which is USF's basketball stadium. Outside okay. of that, you have like the Museum of Science and Industry, um, a handful of other smaller areas. There is a plot of land over there. It, it didn't specify where the 43-acre plot was. Yeah, uh, um, so if it's not really near a whole lot, I, 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 I'm almost on the side of what Joel is talking about and like go to the restaurant, visit the brewery, have some beers. I don't know about staying there. I probably would stay there maybe a night just to be able to say that I did. It's kind of like the, um, the, the, uh, brew house hotel in, um, Milwaukee that Phil, I know you stayed in that with, with me. Um, I don't believe it's actually owned by PBR, uh, uh Paps. But no, but it was it's on in the location site, of their old the brewery. original, correct? Uh, yes. And really, that at least that was what four, five years ago that we went there. Yeah, that area was not really a hopping area. You had you had the bar right next to uh, the hotel, and then you had the historic brewery tour uh, where you could get uh, beers along with the tour. Uh, but that was really it. Uh, we walked around a little bit, but it was. Uh, a lot of old industrial, some housing. So if there's not really other stuff around for people, the the chances of them really staying more than a night just to say that they did it goes down considerably to me because um, this isn't downtown Tampa. So it, the walkability is, is less. So, I, I mean, I'm intrigued, but I don't know if it's going to grab people as much as they are hoping it will be for like this all in inclusive thing or i mean not all inclusive but just like if they're trying to make it a resort i don't know yeah i i'm not sure i i think i would bring my family there and a to show them a brewery and eat at the restaurant and fun things like that if the amenities catered to a family audience so you got to give me a good pool. You got to give me something for my under 21 family member to actually enjoy while we're going there. Otherwise, he's just going to be bored out of his mind. That said, hey, Joel, you just got back from Asheville, and I know you went to Sierra Nevada. Ooh. Would you do a family vacation at Sierra Nevada? I, I'm, I'm going to ask I'm you planning that. it right now. I'm I would it right camp now. in their parking lot and it would yeah. still be the nicest camping that i've ever done there uh ever done period um so i think if you build an establishment that is tens aces across the board like sierra nevada did and, and out just outside of Asheville, i think in their Asheville. location it helps too because like Asheville, North Carolina, that area is really big into hiking and camping. So having this huge, beautiful facility out in the woods um, with with close proximity to hiking trails and, and areas like that, that that one could be a really cool destination type of thing if they had a hotel uh, there as well, that that would probably make a lot a lot of sense. Just something I was thinking about. Well, yeah, that is the news. No seltzer talk this week. I promise it'll be is back there a, in two a weeks. Bell that we can ring. Like is this <laughs> like this is uh 
It took a lot for me not to add seltzer in this week, but um, (laughs) because there is some seltzer news out there, but yeah, I'll wait for another two weeks. I saw a White Claw Pure yesterday at Walmart. I didn't know they had a flavorless version. White Claw and Truly have flavorous, uh, flavorless versions. I never, e- I'd never even heard of that. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's meant to be a replacement for your soda. Pretty. I much. mean, it's Perrier for alcoholics, basically. All right, so our main topic today is talking about safety in breweries. This one Phil has been looking forward to for so long. From absolutely because just, from the sales standpoint. Phil doesn't give a fuck about safety. That's not um, true. <laughs> uh, I I had the distinction of having to be a safety manager at a previous brewery that I worked for. And I attended seminars at CBCs and such and learned a lot about, about safety and how simple it can really be to implement, but that so many people don't do anything or even consider anything when it comes to safety in their breweries. I I think that we are kind of stuck in this. This is an industry that's supposed to be cool and fun and hip. So why do we care about safety? That's like, oh, manufacturing. We are manufacturers. We really are. We have a lot of crazy equipment going into our breweries that can hurt us in many, many different ways. So I think that this is something that is really important to talk about. I'll start off with with Joel. You were with me at the previous brewery when we were implementing a lot of these safety uh, changes. What did you think then? And what do you think now in regards to best practices for, for safety? Well, in the beginning, I didn't think anything back then because I was so new and green. I didn't know anything. Um, You know, I was thrown right on the keg washer from day one, and I did not have any goggles, nor was I told to put on goggles. Um, I go back way far into social media sometimes for a nostalgic purpose, and I'm like, holy shit, there's another uh, brewer there brewing in flip-flops or you know, just, just watching some of the videos of, you know, installing tanks. I mean, it's, it's a dangerous, uh, dirty business sometimes. Um, and it's, it's really mind blowing to think about how many other breweries are opening and applying for licenses and, um, may not have even considered any of this. I mean, safety is such a big deal. I have been, I'm going to sound like uh, Bill Murray in Groundhog Day, like, I've been scratched, burned, you know, cut, fallen. I I busted my tailbone slipping down the brew house steps in non-slip boots. There's all kinds of things that can happen to you. You're dealing with dangerous chemicals. You're dealing with contents under pressure, gases, um, heated things, uh, heavy things, lifting uh, a lot of heavy stuff. Um, And it's good to see, you know, they put emphasis on certain safety things. You know, when you see some of these... uh, job postings, you know, looking for brewers, you have to lift a certain amount of pounds, stuff like that. But, you know, to think about it now, I, we, you know, we try to do as best as we can and, and, you know, wear boots, wear goggles, wear gloves whenever possible, um, you know, constantly sanitizing things. It's such a big deal. And it blows my mind how you look at certain breweries on social media and they're just like, hey, look at so-and-so, they got blasted with yeast. And you look at them and it's clear that there's no, like there's not like an outline where the goggles were. Like, no, it's all over their eyelids. It's all up their nose. Um, You know, nobody's wearing gloves. If you look at Worst Beer Blog, it's like the new thing is erupting tanks. You know, these people who are either dry hopping mid-fermentation or into a carbonated beer. And now it's just gushing and, you know, not only are you wasting all of your beer and, you know, I saw a guy jump down from a ladder as he was getting rained on. I mean, he could have slipped in the puddle he jumped into and, you know, broke his back, busted his head. And people think it's funny. It's like one of those craft beer things where it's like, look how cute and local and independent we are doing all these unsafe things. And it's like, it's really not cool. I don't see any humor in it. And you know, back in the day, we probably posted some things too like that. You know, I, I remember a picture of you, Mike, blasted with yeast. 
but um, it's it's Complete dangerous, man. You know, of circumstance there. Yeah, wrong yeah. Place, I'm, wrong well, time. I mean, well, I mean, you almost got your head taken off by a disassembled compressor that was turned on. Um, yeah, it's scary shit, man. And I'm honestly surprised we don't hear more about injuries. I mean, years ago there was a forklift accident at Stone where someone was killed. Uh, I remember uh, someone earlier than that getting killed by a keg washer. Um, yeah, Red Hook. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 truly scary shit, man. And you know, w- once again, I'm sure I'll be called the fun police, but you know, it's it's no joke when you say lives are at risk. I mean, at the very least, you know, you could have an injury bad enough where you're out of this business. I had Phil, a I had a, a a brewer tell me one time, and this was early, early on. He said, "Yeah, you homebrew," and this was back when I was actively homebrewing. And I said, "Yeah," and he goes, "So." Uh, when you homebrew, how do you how do you prepare? How do you take care of yourself, et cetera, et cetera? And I said, well, you know, I wear shoes and this and that. And he he goes, cool. And goggles? Do you what do you? And and I said, well, it's it's homebrew. It's not that big of a deal. And he goes, okay, well, it, the difference between homebrewing and brewing at a facility is homebrewing can kill you. It could hurt you, maybe not kill yeah. you. You still but can a get facility very hurt by the same is things. 10 times more or 100 times more than what you're brewing in a homebrew. Uh, and I'm not talking about a Mr. Beer kit. Um, and and it's super dangerous. Um, I being on the sales side obviously I've had little involvement in day-to-day operations of it, the actual brewery. Um, there was a stent there for two roughly two years that I was interacting daily within the confines of an actual brewery. And you have to be cognizant. You have to make sure that you're not, you don't have uh, music blaring or, you know, uh, headphones in it so that you can hear things that are going on. It be it a hiss of CO2 coming out of mm-hmm. a tank or a keg. Um, when you're moving it, moving the scariest thing that I have ever done in this industry was moving and setting a tank. And those things are just massive. Uh, and there's no stopping a giant stainless steel vessel from swinging an extra inch and taking you out. Um, I don't care how big you are. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I know some friends who uh, work at a brewery. They were moving in a new tank and it fell. No one was hurt, thankfully. Uh, but shit like that is, is scary. And what you were talking about with the uh, homebrew aspect is there are still a lot of things that can hurt you on homebrew. You, you're maybe not dealing with as dangerous of chemicals, but still, like, you could you could end up having chemical burns of some sort. You, you have stuff under pressure, kegs under pressure, bottles under pressure. I had bottle bombs in, in my house before from one of my homebrews. How about a and, giant carboy that is basically just a five-gallon... Yeah. It, when one of those things falls and drops, it, you have glass shards everywhere, unless you're using better bottles or whatever the plastic ones are. When I sold my house and and moved out I, and moved everything out and did a walkthrough, I still found little specks of brown broken glass in the carpet in my closet. Uh, on the, That was six years later. I mean, I'm, I'm lucky that... Uh, I kept those in my closet. Otherwise, it could have been really fucking dangerous. But one thing that really resonated with me with safety, when I, when I was getting and learning about this to try to create a safety plan for this brewery, I, I was at CBC and I attended a seminar that was moderated by John Mallett from Bell's Brewery and also had brewery operation managers from... Allagash, Three Floyds, Victory, and uh, Cigar City. Madison was uh, on that panel. And there were so many questions and uh, so much talk about safety. And the one thing that really resonated with me was John Mallett saying is implementation has to start from the, the top and go all the way to the bottom. 
every person who steps foot into your brewery needs to follow your safety protocol, whether that be the owner or that be a bartender or bar back who for some reason might have to go into the brewery. They better be putting safety glasses on the moment that they cross that threshold and they need to understand the rules of safety when they're in the brewery. And I think that that's super important because it sets an example for everyone that no one is off limits to this rule. Because if you have, especially you're implementing this uh, procedure to a brewery that has been functioning for a little while and you have employees who've been working there a while and are used to not having any of that going on, they will see someone not following it, an owner or a manager who comes into the brewery and doesn't wear safety glasses, doesn't wear uh, closed-toed, steel-toed shoes. And they think, well, if he doesn't do it, and or they don't do it and uh, don't get in trouble then why why should i and it it really does trickle down from the top and everyone's got to be all on board for it furthermore i I think one thing that we can say is if you're not in the industry and you don't work in a brewery the one thing that you can take out of this episode is stop wearing open-toed shoes or sandals to your brewery tours if you're going to a brewery and you know you're going on a brewery tour Please wear clothes, closed-toed shoes. That That is possibly the largest risk because you have chemicals on the floor. Hopefully, you know, nothing's going crazy, not like a river or anything, but there's hot water, there's chemicals. It's slippery. Please just wear tennis shoes or something closed-toed. It's toed. really the least you could do. Seriously. And, and, and put goggles an on. Thing. Yeah. And... You know, when I was at Sierra Nevada in California a few years ago, we did the real in-depth tour, and they made us wear goggles and earplugs. And as I was touring their facility, um, I just sort of did the do-it-yourself tour uh, where you can wander the halls and look down on all the production and and packaging and everything. Um, There were signs that said no uh, open-toed shoes. Um, And looking down at their employees, I mean, people had gloves. People had uh, earplugs in both ears. And... I get that it's hard to communicate with other staff when you can't hear them, but, you know, there are some seriously loud noises that come out of those machines. Um, And you really have to lead by example. And I think, Mike, like we were talking about with, you know, our previous brewery, I think it's tough to implement later on. Like if you don't do it from the Mm get-go, it's hard to implement later. Um, It really is. I I know. Yeah, we know. I had a lot of pushback Um, from, from employees. I know yeah, we I, used to get fined, and, and way back in the day, it was if you go into the that. brewery and we catch you, be it on camera or in person, without glasses on, it's twenty bucks or whatever, whatever the monetary fine was. And people, it, outside of getting written up, that was one of the only things that people were paying attention to. And now the culture is completely different, where. It, there's buy-in where it's turned around where it's like, hey, man, it, you can't be in here. You don't have glasses on. You don't have um, – you need eyes. You need boots. It, you can't be in here otherwise. And the last we, time I was there, Phil, I definitely recall at the entrance of many bay doors to various parts of the facility, there's a box of goggles. There's a box of earplugs. I mean, it's right there when you walk in. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you don't want it in a situation where – it's in the office in the back somewhere. Like, have those things readily available so it's easier and people can't get into the facility any further and possibly risk injury waiting to put something on. Uh, when when Joel and I were down at Wynwood doing a collaboration of, of a month or so ago, uh, I was blown away by how much safety protocol was in place there. They had, I mean... Now, with the the ownership of CBA, I I assume they helped implement a lot of that stuff. And I think that's a great thing. There's posters, there's stickers, there's reminders, and all of the employees are following it. They have safety glasses on. They have uh, bump guards underneath their their ball caps. Uh, They have gloves. They have earplugs. Like, there's so many simple little things that can be implemented into just having a really much safer environment than you did before having that. And and like, if I may, there's, I just have a list of a few simple things and it starts with just safety glasses, goggles, and gloves. Um, 
just having safety glasses on all the time are going to potentially save your eye uh, from something at some point. I remember at a brewery that we were at, Joel, uh, like someone got smacked in the face with a uh, a, a hose end and having the, the glasses on pretty much saved their eye. Um, and those things cost so little amount of money and it, it can just be immeasurable how much it can save you. Having the heavy duty gloves and the regular, just like uh, non powdered, uh, one fit all gloves are another great thing. The heavy duty gloves for handling chemicals and hot, hot hoses, hot water, that shit is super key as well. And then like lockout, tag out and confined spaces are things that I, uh, it's probably things that people don't understand, but are really important and making sure you, uh, if you're working on something that has electronics to it, um, and can turn on and potentially hurt someone that it is locked out, tagged out, making sure that it cannot be turned back on. Joel mentioned earlier, how I almost got killed by an air compressor that was being worked on uh, without my knowledge. And I was, I was kegging beers and it gave a fault that the air compressor wasn't on. We had the air compressor kind of outside the bay door at the brewery. So I went over, saw it was turned off, turned it back on, and it fucking exploded shooting shrapnel out. Luckily, the opposite direction of the, what I was standing scared the shit out of me someone was working on it and didn't tell me that they were working on it and i could have been killed someone else could have been killed or very very badly hurt um so lockout tag out super important and then confined spaces uh just look at what happened in at the modello brewery a number of years ago where a number of people died from entering a confined space that uh had co2 in it like don't fucking like you got to pay really close attention to confined spaces and non-slip, you know, closed toed shoes for sure. Everyone yeah. should have that if they're anywhere near your drains and shit. Um, and here's one safety thing that some people may not even cons- consider. Just double check everything that you're doing. I, um, yeah. I was, playing with a yeast brink. I was, I was bleeding off pressure. I was basically degassing it to uh, open it up and clean it out. And I was doing multiple at the same time, like more than one of these. And for whatever reason, I just didn't notice that the one I was bleeding off and like the middle wasn't fully bled off. So when I went to undo that tri-clamp, that spear fucking blasted off to the ceiling. If I were standing over this thing, it could have fucked my whole face up. Could have taken me out for real. And that shit's scary. I had like PTSD for a few minutes after that. Like I was, I was truly stunned by what had just happened. You have to not let your guard down. I know it could be very monotonous sometimes. You know, maybe you're in a position where you're just doing the same thing every day. Um, that should actually build up your routine and 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 your vigilance rather than you let your guard down. You should you should have procedures in place to keep you from making mistakes. You know, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Sometimes it almost feels like some of these minor injuries are like, you know, your, your coming of age in, in the brewing industry, but it really shouldn't be. And to look at these things as, you know, acceptable or just part of the business is really wrong. I mean, safety is a big fucking deal. And, you know, just, just slipping and twisting your ankle could take you off that brew deck for weeks. So, um, you know, have your shit together. And if you're planning on opening a brewery, don't, aside from your business plan and everything else, and you're, you know, putting together your, your fucking vanilla IPA recipes, get a safety plan in place. Yeah. Because to me, that shows that you care about your employees. Their safety should be paramount to, to anything else. I don't think it's and if you, just your employees. I think it's your patrons as well. Think about if you're yeah, opening up a brew pub. Very true. If you're opening up a brewery, uh, if you don't have a wall that protects 
your patrons from the brewery or be it a half wall or anything brewery tours think about the unlimited liability that you're opening yourself up against with your insurance policy when you allow someone to go into your brewery without goggles on without close toed shoes on potentially without ear uh, uh, earplugs in um, the little things that don't cost a lot of money, and we've all said that numerous times tonight, can really protect yourself and can really protect your business at the same time. I mean, uh, like Joel was saying about uh, going on Worst Beer Blog and seeing all these uh, volcano things, I've seen a few of these where breweries who have like serving tanks or uh, FVs, brights, right behind the bar and like, some server accidentally like undoes something on one of those tanks and just boom pressure of uh beer and probably a valve of some sort go flying past the bar like if there's a customer sitting there and they get hit with a valve at who knows how many miles per hour they're probably dead and your business is probably dead if that happens too also why do why do so many breweries release they are the ones who release this if these videos because there's no other way that people aren't hacking into security systems of breweries and being like uh, look at these dumbasses no the dumbasses are are putting it out there themselves and wearing it as some sort of badge of honor of stupidity because like I've said, we have a cultural slash immaturity problem in many cases. It's the same reason they boast about C&Ds and all that other shit. I mean, it, you know, we could talk about, you know, all that IP shit, you know, like we did on the last episode, you know, with people being proud of getting C&D, but there's no pride in having someone injured or losing an entire pallet of cans or, you know, erupting tanks. It's It's not funny. I don't see anything cool about it. And... If anything, it's, it makes you look childish to me, and I don't want to ever go visit your brewery. And it normalizes these things, so when these other breweries open up, they think, oh, it's cool, we're going to post a photo of that too, because that just happened to us. And it, it's really dangerous for that to be a precedent we set. Yeah. Uh, when I see stuff like that, I now want to be uh, the, the now rising meme of uh, Josh Hart's reaction. Uh, everyone see that, by the way? What is that? Josh Hart, he's a basketball player. Uh, his reaction to when James Harden hit himself in the face with a basketball. Oh, yeah, I saw that yesterday. <laughs> yeah, like safety is something that should be absolutely be one of the first things that you get into. I, I implore anyone who is listening, who is uh, contemplating opening a brewery to please just do the do the absolute minimum. I know it can be somewhat daunting, but there is a minimum amount that you can do that can be life-saving to a lot of people, including yourself. And it doesn't cost a whole lot of money. I, I, I know I'm, I'm doing a whole little plug of myself here, but I wrote a blog about this on MikeLovesBeer.com last year. You can go to it, find it, and I kind of just break down some simple things that you can do to have a, a basic safety plan at your brewery. Um, please do that. You could probably save someone from being really hurt or save their life at, at some point, and I... I I want nothing more than to never hear about a person dying in a brewery ever again. Like uh, that, that would make my heart so happy to never see that again. And you guys posting videos, you know, riding your forklift around like it's a fucking skateboard or a golf cart. You can cut that <sighs> yeah, shit we didn't out even right get now. Into that shit. Yeah, that that Holy shit fuck. needs to end right now. That is so fucking dangerous, and and they just they think it's funny. Like I, I've seen. I've seen uh, forklifts used in, like, the bottle cap challenge. Like, are you shitting me? Yeah. That one pissed me off so much. Oh, I saw several. See. Oh, really? You saw—I I, yeah. I know one in particular that I saw, and I was just appalled by it. I, like, forklifts are no laughing matter. Like, you you need to have your seatbelt on all the time uh, because that, that was the stone— incident that unfortunately we 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 can say the stone incident and people who are in the industry know what we're talking about that shit can fucking kill you and i 
I writ I wrote people up at the previous brewery for uh, driving too fast on the forklift, not having their seatbelt on. Like it, it's just ridiculous. Uh, like one one person damaged uh, a a uh, a bay door from driving too fast with the with the forks up. Like what what the fuck were you thinking? It's just. They're they're ca- they're cars that have no real center of gravity. Hashtag like, independent though. <laughs> As we we kind of wrap things up here, is is there anything like uh, uh, we've shared some stories about some things that have happened to us safety related? Joel, I remember I took you to the urgent care before because you cut your finger open. Uh, yeah. I, I, you, I, you talked about you uh, slipped on a brew deck uh, steps and hurt your tailbone. Like any other injuries you want to like maybe share with people to let them know, like these things can happen. Yeah. So one thing that is important is just sort of routine maintenance checks running around, making sure your clamps are tightened. Uh, nuts and bolts are all tightened down, shit like that. I went over to flip a couple valves on a hot water heater uh, at one point, and one of the valves was so corroded that as soon as I touched it, the hot side blasted off. I got hit immediately in the chest and and abdomen with, uh, well, the belly, really. I don't have an abdomen. Uh, (laughs) uh, I just got blasted with, you know, the hottest water coming out of that inline heater. It was probably about 140 degrees, and that's not nearly as hot as, you know, a lot of the, the liquids we're working with. It's, it's tough shit. I mean, I, you know, like you said, I fell down the stairs in non, I mean, you just got to like pace yourself. Don't rush down steps. Like I did. Uh, I busted my fucking tailbone like the day before I had a direct flight to, it was either like Portland or Seattle. So that was fun sitting in a coach seat, uh, with my ass just, you know, on fire. Um, I, I couldn't even recall, all of the injuries, but I certainly have the scars to prove it. And it's not cool. Like these aren't badges of honor. I don't show, if I show them off, it's like, here's what could happen. Um, so, you know, stay vigilant, have your maintenance routine, double check everything you're doing. Um, one thing I like to do is just walk the building like a couple of times, uh, before I leave just to make sure pressure isn't continuing to build on a tank, uh, boiler is shut down. Uh, there is no liquid flowing in any particular direction that it shouldn't be. Things like that. Um, just double, triple check. Do it when you're leaving. Do it, you know, before you press that button or undo that clamp. Um, yeah, I mean, I you know, I know the days are long. I know it's hard work, but you know, you're going to be out of work if you get badly injured enough. Yeah. Phil, uh, I know you're you're not in the brewery very much, but any uh, injuries that you've ever sustained, or is there any like uh, just last uh, last notes that you want to send to people? I would just say know your chemicals. Uh, if you are going to work in a brewery, know how your proper dilution rates I think are super important because you can under dilute a chemical. And it can really eat up your hands. Um, I That's happened to me a handful of times where my dilution rates were a little bit off. But outside of that, like, I probably should have had gloves on. So, you know, things of that nature. Pay attention to the little stuff. It's you know, all too many times it's something as simple as just sliding on a pair of eyes to make sure that your eyes are protected. Because God only knows what could fly out at you at any point in time, uh, regardless of where you are. Yeah. I, I mentioned my, my little blog post, the Brewers Association has some free documentation on brewery safety as well. If you go to breweryassociation.org, you can get a number of, uh, wonderful publications that they do, uh, on stuff like that. We talked about the, the food pairing stuff before, but they have a, a training, brochure as well that uh for safety uh that you should definitely go and check out also if you ever have any questions about any of this stuff please feel free to reach out to me or to joel um like we'd be happy to help you out if you if you're trying to start a a safety uh program or you're starting a new brewery and you want to go right from the start with it i i would be thrilled to talk to you 
about uh, safety. Uh, I don't know about Joel, but uh, I definitely <laughs> would. So hit me up, uh, Mike at UnitedWeDrink.com, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it, some of that stuff. Now with that finished up, I think it's about time that we head into last calls. And uh, this is the segment of the show where we give each other a little bit of time to talk about whatever we want, uninterrupted, unopposed, and uh, just kind of get some stuff off our chest maybe or, or talk about something that's important to us. So uh, how about since this wasn't Phil's uh, uh wheelhouse of a main topic you start us off with your last call phil i'm gonna circle back to my na beers uh so i have successfully completed surreal brewing company kolsch which was damn tasty a partake ipa not really my cup of uh non-alcoholic beer um and then i'm currently finishing up a athletic brewing company run wild ipa it's, a, it, it, it's actually very good. Um, so out of all of them, I would say Athletic Brewing Company Run Wild. Uh, the next time I see some more stuff from Athletic, I'm going to pick that up. Um, outside of that, I really would love to see some more breweries uh, venture into this, uh, I guess, style category of beer and continue to push the limits on what uh, quality flavored beer in the non-alcoholic realm can taste like. I just want to say I had an amazing time. Uh, I spent about 48 hours in Asheville, and it was one of those places that not only lived up the, to the hype, but far exceeded it. I can't wait to go back. Aside from the Billy Graham Highway and the Confederate Monument across from our hotel, everything was beautiful. I did not see one Walmart or McDonald's. I'm sure they're out there, but um, all these little, you know, independent oh god why am i saying this in a positive light <laughs> hypocrite <laughs> um yeah all these little cafes and shops and and breakfast joints and and you know i think it was like a two screen movie theater really cool shit beautiful town uh so much was in walking distance um and i enjoyed everything from every place i went i mean we were at the white labs uh kitchen and tap room we were at uh sierra nevada i mean i got fucking emotional just sitting in that place Un it's just unbelievable there's no words to describe it uh thank you to maddie smooth and alex of new belgium for uh the tour uh that was amazing we got a little two-person private tour they took us through the whole place showed us everything it was absolutely unreal unbelievable beers as always of course um just what a great town uh zillicoa um bromari yeah, wicked weed and for those people who were fucking all up in my mentions talking about ab owns them and boo and like go fuck yourselves like i, I I'll, I'll drink where i want you drink where you want and uh yeah that's that it's good beer i just want to I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, to breweries that stick to their guns about things. And uh, it, it can be uh, very difficult sometimes to uh, have a have a vision for what type of beer you want to make or what kind of company that you want to have and see new fads coming along that don't really fit your mold of what you're trying to do. Um, and and saying, "Nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to I'm going to keep keep being me, keep doing me. Um, it doesn't work out for some people. It works out great for others. And, uh, I, I, I give some props to the folks who can stick to their guns, but somehow still make it all, all work in the end because man, it's, it's a tough, tough world out there in craft beer. Um, so if you're into making English ales or into making Belgian beers and, uh, it's not the, it, fun thing to really do but you're doing well with it i give major props to you i love it keep doing you that about does it here for us um next main episode we're going to be talking about responsible consumption uh somewhat of a running theme with like beer health and mental stuff uh that we've talked about in previous episodes but i think that's going to be a cool episode to uh really check out um Phil, do you want to plug anything besides your MySpace and your LinkedIn? No, that's about it. 
Uh, hey, Mike and I have some cool shit coming out this week. Uh, this episode is going to drop Thursday on Halloween. So hopefully either today, the 31st, or tomorrow, the 1st, we will have a brand new Balls Deep Imperial Stout. That's not the name of it. It's just awesome. And uh, our first sour. We're going to have several versions of our first Berliner Weiss. Uh, we did an awesome kettle sour with the help of some Omega Yeast Lacto Blend and uh, the advice of some very uh, well-esteemed sour brewers. So we're, we're really proud of this beer, and uh, we're going to have some cool treatments of it. Uh, we're just going to treat the shit out of it the whole way, so it's going to be awesome. Look for both of these awesome beers later this week at West Palm Brewery. I am Florida D-U-H Brewer on uh, Twitter and Instagram, fuck Facebook. You can follow me personally on Twitter and Instagram at Mike Loves Beer. This show is available on uh, Instagram at United We Drink Pod on Twitter at United We Drink. We're on Facebook as well, even though fuck them, I guess. Uh, <laughs> our website's unitedwedrink.com. And you can listen to the show there or on uh, your favorite streaming app for podcasts, whether that be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, any of those uh, major podcasting apps. You can subscribe to the show and get brand new episodes delivered to the device of your choice every Thursday, including our mini episodes. You can go to unitedwedrink.com slash store to buy a shirt, buy a sticker, buy a button, buy a tote, buy something. Help support the show. Uh, really helps us out. It pays for the hosting and uh, all of that fun stuff. Uh, for everyone here, we'll catch you next week with a mini episode. And then, like we said, next main episode, responsible consumption in two weeks. We'll see you guys then. Happy Halloween. I'll see you. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to the fuck me. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's going on the gag reel at the end of this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>